Hello, I'm Eloisa. This presentation is related to the unit about how to make personal change and we're at the section of real life examples or case studies that are applying the principles of divine truth as taught by Jesus and Mary Magdalene, also known as AJ Miller and Mary Luck, to real life situations and family dynamics. Firstly, we're going to look at an example from my own life that was about taking loving action in our home in order to teach myself and the children about what love is from God's perspective. God has designed a perfect system. And when I say that, well, God designs only perfect systems, but there's many systems in the universe with all of, all of those things actually are encompassed in a framework and what we can refer to as God's laws. There are many, many laws. There are possibly infinite laws. I don't know. I only know a few of God's laws and I feel like that's going to be a lifelong learning lesson and progression in order to discover more and more about God's um, laws and how they work. The beauty of applying principles of divine truth or God's truth, divine truth is God's truth, to a situation is that you can apply principles to any situation regardless if you understand the law or not. And if you apply the principle, then it actually helps and to understand other situations and for you to be able to take a loving action um, where you may not be sure about what's going on. Now, principles are beneficial, but so is a personal relationship with God because that's the fastest way to change and to make, to make positive change in your life is by receiving God's feelings on an issue because you can say, is it loving, is it not? And God can reply via the conscience. God has many feedback systems and different ways of communicating with people. They are through feelings. God communicates with all of us, her children, through feelings. And so there's the conscience and that's what I call the, the direct truth, ch truth channel. And you can get truth immediately via that channel and that uh, you can ask yes, no questions and you'll get a firm feeling of how God feels about an issue. You can also just have a personal conversation and ask God for God's feelings on a matter and God will reply and respond via feelings as well. So firstly, I'll just give you a bit of a background information of what life was like and what was happening in our family. And then we will look at what um, practical things I applied and how they then proceeded to make positive change in our family. So firstly, our home, I suppose you could say, was lawless. There was no rules. Both my ex-husband and I were in rebellion against our parents. We both wanted to uh, believe that we were going to be better than our parents. That we So we had a, quite a bit of arrogance in the way that we were approaching parenting. We wanted to believe that we would somehow like be, well, there were certain projections that I was going to be a great mum and I really, really had an investment in being a good mum. We discussed all the things we didn't want to do the same as what had happened in our upbringings. We had all this kind of a whole, this whole idea about how things were going to be with children. My ex-husband and I had met a number of years before we actually got together. When we got together, I fell pregnant very rapidly. When we first got together, um, we'd act, I'd actually been living overseas and so I moved over to um, Australia um, while I was pregnant and had the last few months of my pregnancy at my ex-husband's and his parents' property down in New South Wales. So we had all these ideas about what it was going to be like. When we had our daughter, it was completely different than what we had imagined and it was like just being completely confronted. At the time, I had no clue what was going on. I felt clueless. I realized that I had zero skills in parenting, that what I had grown up with was, was really not great, but I had no alternative of how to actually deal with issues. I asked both my ex-husband's mum and my own mum sort of for help, but a lot of what they taught me or want, or, or, but a lot of what they told me just didn't feel right to me. And I didn't know what did feel right. And due to my own um, emotional issues that I wasn't even aware of at the time, because I thought I was doing okay and I had a facade that I had things together and that I was um, okay, that completely fell apart when we had children. Uh, we also got pregnant really rapidly after the first child. Within 16 months, actually, we had our second child. 
and then within another 16 months we had our third child. So we had three children under three at one point and it was really chaotic. What ended up happening, which I had didn't realize at the time, it was only in hindsight that I realized it, is that all of my emotions just got exposed via being pregnant and also then having children. And all of these illusions and, and things that I thought were going to happen completely didn't happen. Of course they didn't because what was in my soul was completely different to my image of myself. And this happened for both me and my ex-husband. We were basically confronted with our, ourselves and when you are tired and sleep deprived and you don't really get your addictions met anymore because there's no there's someone who's completely dependent on you as a child you know a child you need to feed them you need to change them you need to look after them you are really for the first time confronted with the fact that you need to look after someone else and your selfishness is well is really exposed and that was for me and, um, and my ex. I wasn't coping and I wasn't feeling great. And uh, I was in complete, um, it was like I was having a breakdown, having kids. And it just, we had three children under three. And so life was super chaotic. And I didn't, it was like having three ref, um, responders exposing everything within me and my ex-husband 24 hours a day. And it never felt like there was a reprieve. As I said, I didn't understand what was happening emotionally. And in hindsight, I can look back and go, oh, yes, this happened and this happened and this happened. At the time, I just wanted to get away. I wanted to. And so I had different methods sleeping. Uh, I was just I would zone out or what you call disassociate in a psychological speak. And I also call it going out of body because it's sort of like you leave yourself in order to avoid feeling what was happening. All of those methods were to get away from feeling emotions and to just feeling how I felt. I felt out of control completely. I, over a number of years, I could realize that something was really wrong with my life. Like inside, I felt exceptionally unhappy. I had a lot of like conflicting emotions. I was trying to act in a certain way and be what the people around me wanted me to be, but I almost, I just couldn't even really uphold that. I was really struggling in every way. I, you know, you could, I suppose, say I had postnatal depression, but all that is is really rage about a whole lot of things that is exposed by a pregnancy and giving birth. And so I was just in a lot of suppression and denial about my emotions. I hadn't heard the teachings of divine truth when I'd had our first child. And it was only when I'd had the second one, I was pregnant with a third, that I actually heard the teachings of divine truth. And when I heard those teachings, I, it was like the first time that I went, well, when I first heard those, I was really resistive to actually listening to them. And I was very invested in my family and I was pretty standoffish and didn't really want to have anything to do with the teaching of divine truth or Jesus and Mary at the time. There was probably a period of, I don't know, six months to a year that I was pretty like, no, not really interested in that. And then after that, there was a number of things that started occurring in my life where I began listening. And we first started listening to the parenting talks, actually, of the Divine Truth teachings. And uh, my ex-husband and I would fall asleep. And we'd like, get 10 minutes in and we'd fall asleep. And we'd just keep falling asleep and we keep falling asleep. So we never really watched the full thing. It took us months just to watch one video because we kept zoning out from it. And I understand now that was again due to emotions that would be exposed when we were listening to it. And because we weren't humble and didn't want to feel them, then we'd, we'd shut ourselves down and fall, fall asleep as a method to get away from listening to more. Um, as well as, quite frankly, it being exhausted physically as well. Um, my husband was working full time on like outside and pretty much escaping the family dynamic by going to work. And I was at home with three kids under three who were just complete nightmare and chaos. Because as we've spoken about in the first sessions of this unit, I was in denial of certain emotions and so was my ex-husband. And so they were just re responding to our unhealed emotional injuries and playing out. So we were dealing with so many effects this is why I dealt with, um, this is why I said in session two, deal with the causes and all of the effects will go away. But when you are dealing with effects all the time, you get exhausted, you feel really clueless, you feel really tired, you get to the end of the tether. I was getting angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier. 
as a form to try and control my own emotional response and to control other people in my environment. That's what anger is. And anger is a guide to say something is wrong. <laughs> and that was the beauty about the Divine Truth teachings. And I suggest you go to the divinetruth.com website. And there are a lot of videos and presentations on that site that you can refer to and get basically listen to what I listen to and then put into practice. And this is just a practical example of those teachings in real life. So what ended up happening is we ended up listening and then um, Jesus and Mary actually would visit us regularly in person. And over the years I've grown a friendship with them and I, and I, love, and I love them dearly. And over to what I really valued was that they got to causes very, very quickly. And they would talk to me about where I was at and they introduced me to these skills of like taking a snapshot of your life. Um, looking at where you're like measuring where you spend your time measuring if you're happy or not and why you're not happy looking at um, causes rather than dealing with effects and then also about a relationship with God and developing that as the most rapid way to progress their feedback was also always personal always specific and always about me and when I say that, it was always about me because I asked a lot of questions and wanted a lot of feedback. And also at that time, my ex-husband blamed me for everything that was wrong with the children and in our life and our relationship. So I got sort of double feedback, if you like, which was super, super helpful. If we're not sensitive to feedback and we won't, don't accept feedback, it's hard to make any progress. I feel so privileged to have had so much truthful feedback in my life. The thing that I also did with the teachings, um, Jesus and Mary would visit us, they'd give us some feedback, and then I would experiment with what they said. And it was via the experimentation that my faith grew. So we talked about some qualities to develop, and they were love, truth, faith, and humility. At the beginning, I didn't feel like um, I wanted, I loved the idea of love, but I had a lot of injured feelings about love, uh, I had, had flawed beliefs about love, and also injured feelings about love and so receiving love or uh, seeking for love though I'd pray for it I didn't feel like I received much love at the beginning but truth I really was big on truth so I really wanted to know the truth and because I grew up in a family that was so deceptive if you like everything was undercover there was such a big facade what people felt and what they said were two completely different things most of the time there was a lot of gaslighting um, manipulation technique meaning that I would say things or have feelings and I'd express those and literally would be told that what I was feeling and what I was saying was completely untrue and never happened so growing up in that environment you start to question what's happening I started to believe what people said rather than what I felt I wanted to believe what people said rather than what I felt because what I felt was was not um, was painful and also felt really um uh, horrible to actually accept the truth of what had happened in my childhood and growing up and then also to face the um, fact of what I had then done in my life as a result of not dealing with um, past pain and hurt in my life so my life felt horrible it really sucked like that's the best way to put it it was painful I wasn't happy I felt like I was at rock bottom emotionally and internally on the outside it looked great, you know, like we lived on a farm physically, we had three healthy kids, I was in a relationship, um, you know, I was trying to pretend that everything was okay and it wasn't, it just wasn't because if you don't work through the emotions, they catch up with you in the end and you're faced with them at some point and whether that's you do this on earth or whether you pass into the spirit world and you do it after you die, at some point you are going to have to deal with with the emotions that you have collected and stored within you and you're going to need to let them out. It seems to me that it's not until we get to a great deal of personal pain that we're even willing to go, wow, okay, something has to change. And it's often only when you've been through certain traumatic experiences or the pain builds up in you so much that you actually choose to make a different decision and try something. So as I said, once I got over the first hurdle of actually listening to Divine Truth, being more open to it, then I began experimenting because I felt like, wow, no, like 
this is the first thing that I can practically apply that sounds logical, that is logical. What I, I the people who are teaching it, they live by what they speak, they are true, they're real, they treat me equally, they give feedback to everyone equally, they treat everyone equally, they are kind to everybody, even when people were literally attacking them in person and I saw that happen, it's like they still had a feeling of love for that person, they dealt with issues, They set their relationship, I, I, I admired just the way that they interacted with each other, they were so, tr like Mary and Jesus are so truthful with each other. There's so many good things that I observed and I went, well, they seem a lot happier than I am and I'd quite like that. <laughs> So I was like, well, you know, and over time it was like I started listening and I was like, well, Jesus shared about what he did in order to get there and what he did. So, and I went, well, okay, based on divine truth teachings, if I do the same thing, then I should be able to have the same result, meaning that I'll be myself, but I should be able to be happier. My life will improve. Um, things will get better. And so there was a possibility that things could be different. And that's the first time in my entire life that I was like, wow, there is a possibility of something real because there was an example for me in my life that I went, wow, this could actually be different. And so I tried it and that was the key. That's the practical application. And that's where I've done my learning. That's, that is why now I have full confidence in God's way, that it is such a wonderful way to progress. There's, it's a personal pursuit that is involves you and God and that's it. Like it, it doesn't cost anything. It is shared, the information is shared completely for free because Jesus and Mary believe that God's truth should be shared completely for free so everyone can benefit. It does have benefits for everybody if you apply it. There's only good things that happen from it. You become like that I have a sense of self. I feel happier. My relationship with the kids is better. So I cannot say how good it was. But how did I get from first listening and being in this state, as I described, of just like chaos? So let's give some more examples of what it used to be like, as I've sort of skipped to how good it, good it got. And at the beginning, so as I said, three kids under three, it was just pandemonium and chaos. Our home, if you'd come to our home and you'd met me there, we would not have been able to have a conversation. I would have two boys basically crawling up my body. If we'd been eating a meal, um, basically the kids would be crawling all over me, um, particularly if we were talking about subjects such as sex, family, or abusive situations. And um, there were a number of other topics as well. If we even mentioned those, the kids were there, um, they'd be taking food off my plate, they'd be eating my, my dinner um, while we're there. They would be just noisy and chaotic. I was talking to Mary one day, I had a little art studio and we were talking about um, passions and desires and we're just having a chat and every time we started talking one of our sons would come up and they would start pulling on my leg and whining and whinging and being noisy and we couldn't talk. As soon as I stopped talking he went off and played quietly and then came back and went off and came back. Every time I engaged with Mary there he was like interrupting. Every time that I stopped he'd go off. And this was a feedback of like, wow, every time I want to do something for me, then I get interrupted because I had, there were certain emotions in me that were causing this demand that I was like, I felt like I couldn't have my own desires and my own passions. And I taught the boys basically that as, as a mum, I was there for the kids' benefit and that I was there to look after them and that all my attention needed to be on them and that they were the centre of my entire world. So the effect was that every time then that my attention was not on them, they'd feel like, hold on, I'm not getting that addiction met now. I'm going to go right over and I'm going to, I'm going to bug her until she gets back to giving me the full attention. And that was the effects of me not dealing with a lot of sadness in my past and a lot of emotions that were going on. So you know, there was effects and then there was a cause. So the effects were children climbing over, being ruckus, just like everything. And when I say bad, like it was bad. I'd clean the house and within 15 minutes it was just totally, totally decimated. And I mean like stuff thrown everywhere. They'd be outside in the mud, they'd walk it all through. They would get flour and they one day they flowered our entire bed and put honey and like food all through our bed. Um, they would be grubby and they'd get into our bed. They'd leave fruit in our bed. 
Um, if I was having a sleep or something, they'd literally come in and peel my eyes open to try it. <laughs> they'd be like, they'd be like, mum, mum. And then I wouldn't answer. And one time, like, I was sort of like, I was like, no, I'm not going to open my eyes. I'm just going to pretend that I'm asleep. And they're like, mum, mum, are you awake? <laughs> and they're literally peeling my eyes open. <laughs> and I was like, I just was like, oh my goodness, like, what have I created? You know, like, the demands were so intense. So, what I so what I'm illustrating here by all of these effects that I'm telling you about is that we had no law so I was not being a loving authority and I was not being a loving governor of our home I really didn't want to take responsibility for that I didn't want to have any conflict I didn't want to make a stand for what was loving I didn't want someone to be angry at me so I was very afraid of the children being angry all they had to do was just like chuck a tantrum and I was doing what they wanted so there was, and this was a throwback from the terror that I had from my dad, um, because it was particularly with the boys, um, when they were even the slightest bit upset, or um, I would be feeling guilty and trying to make that go away. So I hadn't dealt with my fear and my terror of my dad's rage towards me. And so then it played out in the effects with the boys to basically um, expose to me, like, you have an issue here. I could recognize we were lawless. And when I say lawless, it's like we're like this with God's laws. And I don't, it's even though we have adult bodies as adults, we are like little kids because we haven't actually emotionally developed and worked through the emotions that we had as children. And because we haven't done that, those emotions are stored at the age that, that they were um, put into us. So a lot of us are acting like, you know, one, two, three to seven year olds. And we're acting that out, even though we are so-called adults. And you can see this, you know, you look at Parliament House and you look at how they um, they speak to each other in there. You look at how adults try and resolve conflicts, which they don't. You look at the way that people interact these days, like there's not much love, there's not much truth. They don't actually resolve conflicts. They just all get sort of bitchy at each other or they blame other people or they ghost people. I think that's the word for it now. They completely ignore them. Conflicts are not resolved, you know, I mean, why is there war? Because no one wants to resolve the conflict in a loving manner. There's more to it than that, but just basic. So basically the family, what I started to see was the family is just a, a small micro representation of wider society. And I started to go, oh, well, if we can change some things in the family, then maybe, you know, there's a possibility of world change, which had always appealed to me. But also if I can change something in the family, and I heard that by changing me, I could change something in the family. So for the first time, at first I was, I was a bit upset about that because I was like, well, I don't want to have to change me. Like people did horrible things to me and they should have to feel their feelings and they should have to do it. And I felt really upset about that, but I let myself really feel it. Like I went to my room and felt like that's unfair, like sobbed in the sense of angry sobbing, like really upset about it and angry. And then I started to, um, once I'd sort of gone through all the anger about the fact that people had done unkind things to me and unloving things and actually quite evil things to me and that I didn't feel loved about that. It's like as I sort of worked through just even those surface beliefs and those feelings that I felt they should, as I had to go through that before I went, well, actually, the fact that I can change and I'm not dependent on the people who have hurt me changing or who, and I'm not dependent on the on what has happened in my past and the people in my past changing, that is such a gift. Imagine if you couldn't, if you had to wait for someone else to change before you could make loving change. Man, it would be horrendous, you know, it would be horrendous. So it is a real gift that God has created it, that we can change ourselves and that then, you know, and that is our responsibility to do that. You might be listening to this video and going, nope, don't feel like that. As I said, just feel. You're going to need to feel your false beliefs and your flawed definitions of love that someone else should feel that. And I watch our kids at the moment going through some of those feelings. They're angry at the parents because they feel like it was very unfair. And it was unfair because the parents, were, like me and my, their dad, has been very selfish. And we didn't want to deal with our issues. And so now we pass them on to them or we created situations where um, things happened to them that harmed them. And they feel like, well, this is really unfair. And they're going to need to go through that process in order to get to the point where they actually can go, well, actually, it's really loving that I can at least change myself. 
So some of those things came into being. The, the key to the change in our house was um, holding the children or you could say it was like a physical restriction. And the point of doing this was to actually love the children and to be also to, for the parents to take responsibility for the harm that they had done. So what we did is I'd heard about that you can restrict a child in a loving manner. Um, I'd heard that this was a way to demonstrate or make transparent God's laws in action and what is and is not loving so that a child learns by an immediate um, loving consequence that is um, that is related specifically to the unloving issue that if you take an action right there and then then the child's going to associate that with and they can learn about love through that process. It took me a while to be open to actually trialing it and then I did and it changed our lives. So when we did it, I had I definitely was more a bit I was more self-aware at the time. I had to examine my motivation for doing it. Was I going to punish the children or was this about correcting unloving things that happened in our family? Anytime that it was about anger or punishment, there was no then I needed to go and feel that and experience my own anger about it before I engaged the process. Because every time that I, um, you're going to punish a child, that's not loving them. And that's you, you actually harming a child more than actually dealing with your issue. So one day I woke up and I was like, right, I've got nothing to lose. Life feels so bad right now that I'm going to just do what I've heard is the loving thing. And I'm going to see and measure the results. I'm going to do an experiment and I'm going to commit to the experiment. And I'm going to do the experiment for as long as it takes so that I know what's going to happen. And I did. I chose demands on physical violence to be the, the things that I would focus on. They were the biggest issues in my life at the time. And so there was just constant demands from both my ex-husband and the children and also others actually in my environment. And I also had a lot of demands on my environment. And then there was also the um, physical violence. The boys were, and they were very young, um, but they were like two or three and they were punching me and they would like hit my breasts and they would punch my body and they would hit me and they would they thought that was fine to do that and I felt that somehow I deserved it like that was just an attraction for me to absorb and that I couldn't really do anything about it. Those are effects of beliefs that both my ex-husband and I had about violence and about a man being able to be violent towards a woman. Um, I won't go into my uh, details about that but those were the effects that were happening and I recognized the effects and uh, at the time I didn't understand necessarily the causes but I knew like okay I have some action that I'm going to take I have a desire to do it I've heard there's possibilities I've got some faith meaning that um, I didn't know exactly what's going to happen but I had at least a, uh, a faith in the possibility that something better might happen if I took this action. And so I did. I wo woke up, I walked out of my room, there was a demand immediately from one of the boys. So what I did is I held him. And so what that means is you put him into like a bear hug and for him, that because our kids were quite tall, I actually lay down on the floor and I um, held his arms and I held his legs and I just um, held him and restricted his physical movement. And I just said to him kindly, I just said, look, you're demanding of me and that is unloving. You're being demanding, so I'm, I am restricting you so that you cannot, you can't do that. Now, he went through a process of enraged, just enraged, like just screaming, writhing, trying to get out. And I held him and then he, um, and I felt terrible. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm hurting him. This is terrible. Um, you know, I had all of these feelings come up. And this is the beauty of doing the holding is, or the restriction of a child is that the parent is faced with what they have created. And so it's, it becomes a correction process and a repentance process if you're willing to go through it as a parent. Because as a parent, you can begin to actually feel like, wow, I've created this. And this is the this is actually like the entitlement to get their demands met. This is because of what I've done, and so I would just feel how I felt as the child as uh, the child was feeling whatever they felt, and he was basically his addiction was getting restricted. So the demand, I was saying no, and so he's chucking a tantrum, and he would like fly all around, get so angry, everything. I was just crying quietly, like just crying and feeling my feelings and and feeling like, my goodness, this is what I've created. And the emotion just came straight up for me. 
then he um, was still holding him and he just went limp. And I thought, oh goodness, like maybe it's okay. You know, like maybe this is it. This is, this is all that's involved. And I just slightly left, like slightly opened my arms just to just a little bit. And immediately he was like thrashing to get away and to get out. And I realized, oh no. And also with some feedback as well a bit later from Jesus and Mary, I realized, no, this is just another form of basically passive aggressive rage. And there's nothing's changed here. It's just total rage. It's just a different method because this is some of the methods that I was responding to at the time. So they'd either do like this overt rage. If they didn't get what they wanted, then they'd go all sulky and get like all passive aggressive with me and project at me like you're a bad mom and you're terrible and you're hurting us and we hate you. And I'd be like, oh my God, I don't want to feel any of those feelings. And I'd be doing what they wanted. So this was them going through their tantrum, basically. So kept holding them, kept holding them. And we went through a few cycles of this, like overt rage and passive aggressive rage, overt, passive, overt, passive. Until then they started having um, another experience where he just started like um, uh, feeling, uh, feeling different feelings, like sort of crying a bit and, and then was crying and all of these and feeling, uh, the feeling changed and different feelings and everything until the point where and it, this was over about an hour period of time until the point where um, he relaxed in, in, a sen in a way and I think he was having a bit of a cry and, but he relaxed and he didn't struggle or try and, and leave. And I kept saying all through this, I was like, you're being, re you know, you're being restricted because you're demanding. This is unloving because this is demanding. Demanding isn't being kind to other people. Really simple language because it was, he was like three. So it was about him being educated um, and making it like, you know, this is because of the demand and making it very transparent. So then when I've been through this whole process, I then sort of like released it and he didn't try and get away and, and he ended up, we ended up having a hug. And then he just got up and then went off and played. And it was the first time ever, ever, they just quietly went off and played. And that day he said, oh, I can't remember what it was for. He just said, thanks, mum. And it was the first time he'd ever thanked me for anything in his entire life. And it was like having a completely different child. Um, something that I did admit to say is our children were exceptionally spirit influenced and overcloaked due to certain um, injuries in both their dad and myself. And we were very open to spirit influence at that time. So our kids were very overcloaked at the time. Um, but the restriction works whether your kids are spirit influenced or not. It doesn't matter. Um, so... After I'd restricted the first child, I think I took about five steps down the hallway and the next child came along, we remember we had three, and was completely demanding. So I did exactly the same thing and we went through exactly the same process and that took about another hour or an hour and a half to do that. And, um, and I just felt more and more and more of my feelings like because they just kept getting exposed and each child was slightly different. So um, this time uh, one of them tried to bite me and scratch me and they headbutted me and I, I remember being hit in the chin um, and it really hurt actually. Uh, like you, my teeth sort of went together and stuff and was starting to be sort of like even like thrashing around and like chomping me and things like that. And so then I was like, well, you know, you're being restricted for your demands. You're also being restricted because you're being violent to me, um, you know, et cetera. They went through their process well until they got to the point where they sort of relaxed as well and, and had a cry. And when I say a cry, it was a grief cry. They didn't cry a lot because at the time I was very shut down to my own grief and so was their dad. And I wasn't really open to crying and anything that you're not open to as a um, parent, it's hard for a child to uh, feel in the environment, say if you're really shut down to, to feeling sadness, then your child's going to also be quite shut down to sadness or feel like they can't actually express and feel their sadness. So, but we got to this point in the, um, the holding where they were actually just in the restriction, they were no longer struggling and they didn't try to, like, they were no longer angry. It's like their feeling had changed and they were sort of more connected to their sadness. So they sort of had been through a process of anger like fear, well, anger and they're getting, not getting their addictions met and then um, end up being restricted because they'd wanted to be lawless. They wanted to just do whatever they want. And when you actually stop someone doing whatever they want, there's going to be some rage, you know, and then under the rage, there's fears and under the fears, there's grief. And so that was the process that we were going through. 
Um, so the second child happened. Then I got just outside the kitchen, which was probably about 10 steps away from that, down our hallway and through our lounge room. And the next child was really demanding. So this was number three. So I was like, no, no demands. Because remember, I committed to actually doing something about this unloving behavior in our home. And so I restricted them as well. And the same process went through. And it took longer. It took me about four hours, I think, to get to the kitchen that morning and actually have breakfast and do things. The positive results of taking that action, and remember the, the restriction the holding was about teaching both myself and the children about loving law and about God's law and how God actually restricts us. And there's a penalty on our soul every time we break a law. And so this was making that transparent. So it was taking something physical. And what I love about the holding or the, restri uh, the restriction process is that both the parent and the child are faced with their unloving behavior. And so it's not just the child's fault and punishing a child. It's about an equal amount of, well, this is the creation, like this is the creator of the unloving creation. I'm taking responsibility now for correcting the unloving behavior and the unloving um, causes that I've created in a child in order that they're acting out of those effects. And that's what I love about it is that you are taking responsibility as the parent. So often parents want to be punitive and punish a child or give them like sort of false rewards, meaning that they're not about love and the self-satisfaction of doing a loving thing. They're about getting something, an addictive thing. They then become de dependent on the addiction rather than actually doing it for the self-satisfaction of the reward that they get from being in harmony with the law. So this was a correction process for both the parent and the child. And I really, really like that about the holding and restriction process. So we then continued to do um, this. I think I was more committed than my um, ex-husband, but he would hold the kids at some point. He would be quite um, upset and uh, it, he found it quite distressing and, and I found it distressing at the beginning as well. And he found it distressing knowing he had released the kids earlier than w whatever. So they just learned that if they could wait, wait him out. Um, whereas for me, it was like, no, I'm going to, I'm here. And you, you, well, if you do it, you need to commit. It's not just like holding and then letting them go. Cause all they realize is that, oh, I just have to wait for a bit and then mum will let me go. Or I just have to go limp and mum will let me go or dad will let me go. And if you do that, or I just have to say nasty things and mum and dad will let me go. If you do that, then you're just, you're just teaching them that they can wait you out. And that's not a good thing. If you're going to do it, commit to it and finish it. Be consistent. Being consistent with children is very, very important. And law is always consistent. There is no wriggle room in God's laws. God's laws are absolute. Uh, there is no room for negotiation. They are either, it's you either love or you don't love. You're either moral or you're not moral. You're either unloving or you're loving. That's it. You know, you're truthful, you're not truthful. There's not shades of gray. It's, it's pretty black and white. It's certain. There's a lot of nuances and there's a lot of, um, uh, I suppose, I don't know, detail in God's laws and, ve and very specific things, very specific the laws are. So if you and I act in exactly the same manner, for exactly the same reason, exactly the same motivation, we will get exactly the same penalty on our soul. So they're very fair, very just laws. But if you act in a certain manner and I act in a certain manner, we have different intentions, different motivations, different um, injuries, different like different, then the penalty will be different for each of us because God's laws take into consideration every single thing about why a person acts in the manner that they do. And the penalty is perfect and specific to that person. And I also want to say on the flip side are the rewards of God's laws. So God rewards abundantly the loving behaviors. When you're in harmony with God's way and when you're in harmony with love, God has abundant rewards for us with that. And that's why life gets so much better when you live in harmony with God's laws, because there's a lot of feelings. And if you, you can ask God on that and say, God, how do you feel when I'm in harmony with your laws? And it's an overwhelming feeling because we're so in disharmony and the amount of like love and pride when you are in harmony with God's laws is quite amazing. And God really wants to reward the loving things. So that's why the more loving you are, the more actually rewards you receive. So this was the learning in our home uh, about 
God's laws and that there is a loving framework and that due to my disobedience of the law and me going, no, I don't want to have, I want to be lawless and I don't want to put any law for these children, that actually caused a lot of, um, you know, uh, painful effects. And as we sort of talked about earlier, the effects were just like chaotic and terrible and taken over my life. And I just felt completely out of control and clueless on how to fix them. Once I actually implemented the holding or the restriction of the children in a loving manner and my intention was to love them, my intention was to correct the unloving things that I had created. I was very aware of what I had created in the children and I was very aware that I was responsible for fixing that. And that became more, as I felt more, that became like even more and more and more and more firm in me until now, like today, if you meet me <laughs> in real life and even on this video, I am very firm and I know not what not to do <laughs> in regards to unloving parenting because I know the pain and suffering that that causes for children and also for the adults. And it's, it's a terrible legacy that we create as parents and of how unloving we are due to our selfish, really boils down to selfish motivations. And when I say that, yes, we are also, we've also been children. We've also been harmed. We've also had a lot of um, pain in our childhood for different reasons. People who feel superior and better than others also, like that's actually a very, very unloving thing to, to teach a child that they are better and actually superior to another person. And that has a lot of penalties on, from God's laws perspective on an individual who feels that they are not equal. But so, and when you feel inferior, and you've been treated inferior, that has a lot of pain with it too. If you continue to act that inferior out, then you're also contributing to superiority in other people. And that is like, you can ask God how God feels about that. God feels very strongly that that is wrong. And I feel now very strongly that as a parent, we have a responsibility to correct the damage that we have done and the unloving things that we have done. And that is the beauty of God's way and of God's laws because God wants us to correct the unloving things we've done. God hasn't done unloving things. Humans have. And it's very important to see the difference and see that God is actually doing all that God can in order to educate us about love so that we can become more loving and do more loving things. But as humans, we are often acting out of our injuries and our addictions and, um, not, and acting in our fear and acting in anger meaning that we're not feeling and releasing our fear and anger, rather we're taking actions out of the fear and anger, which are always going to turn out badly because they're not in harmony with love. Fear and anger cannot exist at the same time as love. It just is impossible. And also, we're creating a lot of pain and suffering for the next generation and other people, our partner um, and other people we interact with if we continue to feed our addictions and to live in them. So this correction process was about me seeing, okay, I'm lawless. I've created a lawless society in our family. And what am I going to do to correct it? Because that's my responsibility. And I, the method that I chose was about um, holding or loving restriction of the child, which was also a loving restriction for myself because I was faced with my own emotions. And via the restriction process, I came much I actually was feeling as well while I was restricting them and coming to actually understand why I had done what I had done. And a lot of my own terrors and my own fears, avoiding them, avoiding my terrors and my fears, was the cause of why I had actually done this. I didn't want to have conflict, as I said, and I didn't want to actually say no. And I felt like I didn't want to stand up to the angry man. And there were all kinds of different things. It was very interesting as I actually did this process and worked through it more and realized, hold on, actually I can cope now more with what was coming at me. And also remember these are like little children who I was really worried and afraid of. But the emotion in me, it didn't differentiate whether it was a child or an adult. It was just that I had the terror and that just acted out um, under specific circumstances. Um, uh, at the, simultaneously, as I was going through this correction process in our family, I also started speaking up more and having more courage to speak up with my own family, so to my own dad about certain things that he had done to me um, in my past and certain creations that he'd created in me. And the act for me of speaking up was really important because it's something that I was not, not doing. So I was doing the opposite of what my addiction dictated in that situation. And instead of withdrawing and being quiet and saying nothing and not saying about, about you know, talking about 
what had happened in the past and things like that, I did start speaking about that, particularly with my parents. And that set in motion a whole lot of um, events that caused me to expose emotions in myself as well, which the more I felt, the more I understood what was going on in my life, the more the effects in my life actually started to change. And so over a period of time, the children went from what I described at the beginning of this video, after the restriction process, the spirit influence disappeared. So they, I was left just with the children, not actually with all of the spirits as well. Sometimes it was like having, you know, um, you know, 10 or 15 teenage boys in my home all at once, all just having a field day doing whatever they wanted. That's what who was overcloaking the kids. And so that all disappeared. And so then I was just, it was like so much calmer and so much easier because I wasn't dealing with all of that as well as what was happening was just a behavior. And so life got um, a bit calmer and a bit more, I suppose you could say manageable, but it was that I actually felt more confident and also started growing a bit of a sense of myself and also a feeling of like, no, I want to, I want to love. So though I still had um, issues and feelings around love, I started to see what love was not. And I also started to see the benefits of being truthful and also um, really came to love truth and really, 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 really love truth. And um, every time that I took an action and did an experiment and followed through and was consistent, I had a positive result. And so this meant that my faith grew. And as my faith grew, then I, um, and my faith then became more faith and humility because I started to feel better about myself, and this was a, not not immediately. It took some time. Uh, there were immediate positive results, and that built my faith. But also, the way that I started feeling about myself over a period of a, of a couple of years actually changed as well. I went through some painful emotions and came out the other end feeling just like, no, I'm not to blame for all of the world's issues. I'm not responsible for everyone's like unloving behaviour. That's not my fault. And I now feel very, you know, it, it's very clear to me that. If I'm unloving, that's my responsibility. If you're unloving, that's your responsibility. And I'm not always taking on, like in the past, I used to think if someone was unloving to me and unkind, that I must have done something wrong. And now I know, no, I didn't. If someone chooses to be unloving, that is their choice. Regardless of what I do, even if I'm unloving, that is their choice. And because I know that I can make a choice to love someone, even if they're not loving me. And so these are lessons that I've learned by practical application of the, of, you know, so I had to do a lot of self-reflection and I still do a lot of self-reflection. And as I said, that became emotional for me. And the more that I reflected emotionally, meaning that I felt feelings and I expressed feelings and I experienced feelings. And that would actually give me a lot of information. So instead of thinking intellectually about things, which I'd been very trained to do and which in my family is honored and respected, I began making this sh like shift and it was been quite hard um, at the beginning because there, there was a lot of feelings and beliefs and, and thoughts and flawed definitions of love about that. And I started though making the shift to actually feeling what I felt and then um, letting myself go through that, however long that took, and what I found at the end of feeling it is I'd come to the truth of actually what had happened. I'd be very clear. I'd remember everything that happened. I'd be very firm about, oh, no, wow, this is what happened. And this is what it felt like for me. That was my experience. And I also began developing, uh, for a long time, I didn't have a relationship with God because I felt, oh, there's just a lot of different feelings and there were beliefs about my own parents and there were fears and all kinds of different things that I needed to work through. Um, now I really, I'm developing my relationship with God and I, and I really value it because of how rapidly I can get information via God's feelings. And so all of the work that I've done in, is getting out of my head and more into my heart and becoming familiar with my own feelings, how I express my feelings, how I feel, um, how I feel in different situations, recognizing when I've got addictions, when I don't have addictions, when I'm genuinely feeling, when I'm not feeling, um, you know, there's so many different nuances of feeling. Like it's an amazingly specific thing, feelings. And it gives you a lot of information. And the more that I'm connecting to my own feelings and my own experiences and it, the more expressive I am, the more I'm opening and, and the more desire, the more aspiration I have for my relationship with God and to love God and what does that mean and what does that look like and how does that feel, the more I'm opening as well to receiving God's feelings. And that's a really beautiful uh, experience. 
creating law and loving governance in the family and to make that transparent to children. And so all of the things that I've said of my own experiences are about loving governance and by restricting them, you're making God's laws transparent to both the parent and the child. So if you are going to engage um, you know, the holding or the restriction process, you need to be consistent. Look at your motivations and intentions. Is it to love? and for you to make loving correction in your family, or is it about punishment and harming another person? If that's your motivation, I don't suggest you do it. You need to deal with your anger and your rage and why you feel like it's okay to punish a child because that's unethical and it's out of harmony with love. Plus the fact the effects that a child is um, illustrating to you in a family is you and your partner's primary responsibility. So the mum and the dad of that child, that's their problem, like that is their issues that are being reflected. And that is something that you are responsible for correcting. Loving restriction is a really rapid way to, um, to correct unloving behavior. And if you do it um, early enough, it's pretty short and rapid as long as you're consistent. If you, the longer you leave it, then just the more entrenched addictions are and unloving behavior is and the more um, fight there is, so the bigger the tantrum's gonna be. Something to note is that you are also gonna need to go through this process. And though you might not be physically restricted, you too are gonna have some big tantrums when you actually hit up against God's laws and you become aware of what's going on. You don't have to have the tantrums. You can have humility and just go straight to your terrors or your feelings and feel those things. Um, or you don't even have to have an addiction. You could just feel your anger in a loving manner, meaning on your own, in the privacy of your own room or on your own somewhere, not involving anyone else. And you could actually feel through that very rapidly and get to your terrors, feel through those and feel through your um, grief. And those, when I uh, break it up like that, it's more of an organic process. A lot of the time, there's just a lot of feelings. Just let yourself feel them. Be humble to whatever feelings, whether those feelings are painful or pleasurable. Feel them just like a little child does and demonstrates to us so beautifully. They just feel what they feel in the moment. They're not self-analyzing. They're not worrying about it. They're just feeling. Let yourself feel and um, move on. You can go back to the skills that we were talking about and look and take a measurement of self-reflecting on your life. If no change is happening, then you can measure that. So this is a real life example of how to begin the process of making God's laws transparent in the family and also about a parent correcting their unloving creations. It's also looking at how effects um, and how then dealing with causes, taking some action and actually having a loving restriction caused then God's laws to be more transparent and also enabled the parent to start seeing how when they didn't um, when they were not a loving authority and were not taking like, loving governance in their family, the results of that and how it was painful, painful effects of, of not doing so. And once love was more consistent in the family, then things got a lot smoother and better and more enjoyable. So that brings me to the end of this presentation and I'll see you next time.